The topic of today is continuity. Okay, sort of works. You wish I had the pen, but this will do. So continuity is a property that most graphs have, or at least most graphs you've ever looked at have, although you haven't, of course, used that word up until now. But suppose we're looking at a graph of a real world quantity. Suppose we're looking at a graph of the temperature, for example. And we'll look at how the temperature changes over time. So this can be going from zero to how many hours do I think there are in a day? This can be going from zero to 24, where zero is midnight and 24 is also midnight. And the y axis can be the temperature. And say I draw a graph that looks like this. So it's kind of cool in the eve, in the night, and then it heats up. I'm afraid to 105 degrees if the weather forecast can be believed. Maybe if you see, or maybe I draw something like this though. And I think most of us have an intuition that a temperature function can't really look like this. Heating up takes time, cooling down also takes time. So if you have a sudden jump like this, that's not the quality that most real world graphs ought to be exhibiting. And that's summarized by the statement that most real world graphs are continuous. Before I um, even define continuity though, let's look at more of these jumps. Let's try to make a few more statements about these. So the first statement I'll make is that these jumps are more likely to occur in artificial, let's say, human-made environments. So, for example, a situation where you might expect these jumps to occur would be if you look at the number of years I've been working at Chadron and spelling, well, you look at my salary. I mean, you might expect to see something like this. My salary is constant. The union negotiates a raise, my salary jumps, then it's constant again. The union negotiates another raise, 
then it's constant again. So you can see graphs with jumps in them. It's just that they're much more likely to appear in fields like business and economics than it is to appear in the more sort of natural disciplines. If a jump occurs in that's I know I'm speaking informal, but that's fine. If a jump occurs in kind of a natural situation, by which I mean not human made, it usually represents some kind of outside Influence. So, as a situation of, as an example of what I mean by that, we could look at the velocity of a falling. object. So we'll dump an object from a large height out of a plane or something, and we might see a graph that looks like this. Here's time, here's velocity. Velocity is different from speed in that velocity can be negative. And in fact, if an object is falling, its velocity is negative. So we might see something like this. The object falls, it accelerates, it eventually kind of reaches what we call terminal velocity and kind of remains constant for a while. And then, of course, eventually the object is going to hit the ground. And when it hits the ground, its velocity will turn more or less instantly to zero. It will no longer be moving. So going back to what I said about these jumps usually representing some kind of outside influence, here the outside influence is the ground. The object was falling, it wasn't interacting with the ground, and then suddenly it does interact with the ground. It it hits it. So the purpose of this class is to investigate or to start to investigate these jumps. And let's start with a definition. A function f of x is said to be a continuous at a value x equals c if f 
of C equals the limit as X approaches C of F of X. And I've stated this definition just in one swoop, but we can think of this definition and it's common in textbooks to see this definition um, sort of divided into three pieces. For that equality to hold, first of all, f of x must, ex sorry, f of c must exist. f of c can't equal a limit if f of c doesn't exist. And two, the limit as x approaches c of f of x must exist. Again, the limit can't equal something if it doesn't exist. And third, well, we have the equality that I wrote on the previous frame, that the limit as X approaches C of F of X equals F of C. And what we've been seeing, this jump here, these jumps here and this jump here are all failures of continuity. So you can probably guess the following definition. I mean, it's just sort of standard English, the opposite of continuous is this continuous and a function is discontinuous if it is not continuous. And I said this out loud, we can write it down as an example. If the graph dumps at C, so the examples we've been looking at, that's an example of a discontinuity. And it's certainly not the only way a function can be discontinuous, but it's the way we're probably the most interested in in this class. Because if a function jumps at C, which of these conditions is it failing to satisfy? If a function jumps at C, then it's something to do with the limit. Because, and this is now going back to what we talked about yesterday, 
for the limit to exist, the one-sided limits have to exist. It shouldn't matter which direction you're approaching a value from. And if you look at this value that we're interested in here, it clearly does matter which direction you're approaching this value from. If you're approaching from the right, it's just going zero. If you're approaching from the left, you're getting large in the negative direction. So let's put Well, no, let's just look at an example now. Let's look at a rational function, x squared minus x minus two divided by x minus two. And let's ask the question, could this function be continuous at x equals two? Could this function be continuous at x equals two? I'm now asking that question. No, no, because it's, it funks the, the very first condition we have. It's not defined at f of two, so there is no possibility of it being continuous. But let's make this a little less obvious. Let's turn this into a piecewise defined function. F of X is going to be this rational function everywhere except for two and at two. We're going to specially define it. We're going to let f of x be one. Suddenly, the question of whether or not this is continuous is a lot less trivial. It satisfies the first condition clearly f of two does exist. We are specially defining the function so that f of two exists. What's less obvious are conditions two and three, whether the limit exists, whether the limit equals f of two, if it does exist. Those require work, and let's do that work. Let's let's do this as a checklist. We have three conditions. F of two has to exist. Check the limit has to exist. A lot less obvious. Let's first make the observation. When we take the limit, ah. <laughs> when we take the limit, as x approaches two, we're not interested in what happens at two itself. That's something we said when we defined the limit. So if we're looking at the limit, 
act as X approaches to, we're looking at the first piece of this function. We're interested in what happens when X gets close to two, but does not equal two. So we're interested in the limit as X approaches two of X squared minus X minus two divided by X minus two. And actually, why don't you take this limit for me, a bit of a break from listening to me talk. I'll walk around while you do that if you have questions. The first step would be to just try to use our limit rules. This is the limit of a fraction, so you could try taking the limit of the top divided by the limit of the bottom. But if you do that, you get a division by zero error, zero divided by zero. So the only, as I say, the only kind of limit trick we're learning is if you're trying to deal with a rational function, one polynomial divided by another polynomial, and it's giving us a division by zero error. We can try factoring and then seeing if anything cancels. And that is the case here. Our X minus twos cancel. X plus one is a polynomial. We just stick that in there. And now moment of truth. F of two does exist. The limit as X approaches two does exist. And either they're equal or they aren't. Well, we might, what is f of two? We defined it to be one. So at the last hurdle, we fall down. f of two is one, the limit is three. They're not equal. So it's discontinuous at two. But I could modify this function in a very trivial way to make it be continuous. I mean, this function is defined on all of the real numbers. I would only need to change its value at one point to make this function continuous. What would I have to change to make this function continuous? The one, thank you, thank you both of you. <laughs> if this one, were instead a three, <clears throat> this function would now be continuous. This limit would exist. I mean, this function would be defined, it would equal three. This limit would be three. And now 
That would change my answer down here. They would be equal. And this function would be continuous. This, um, this situation shows up a fair amount, at least in pure math. I know that a lot of you are in pharmacy. I don't really have the background to say what does or does not show up in your field. But in pure math, at least, it's a pretty common situation. So we'll give it the name. Suppose that a limit as X approaches C of F of X exists, but the function is discontinuous at C. How would that happen? How would the function be discontinuous at C? Well, either F of C could fail to exist, or F of C could equal something other than the limit. So the limit exists, but there's something stopping this function from being continuous. Then this function can be made continuous with very little bother. Just like here, when we had one, it wasn't continuous. We just changed that one value. Suddenly it is continuous. In general, you can create the piecewise defined function that's f of x, that's f of x, trying to squeeze this in on the same frame, when x is not c, and where x is a c, we just redefine the function. to equal the limit. This is continuous. And we call it the continuous extension. And it might seem like we're doing something here that we shouldn't be allowed to do. How is it possible that we can just take a function and change it? It seems like we are maybe cheating in some way. But if you look at this graphically, let's look at an example. Let me go to Desmos and let me go ahead and I guess we can we can keep or what's uh, what am I looking for? We can let's look at you know a slight variation of this. 
let's just say this function isn't defined at two. So let's go to Desmos and let's look at this. X squared minus X minus two. Divided by X minus two, fix that. So here's the function. And I mean, this function is not continuous at two, but that fact is not even visible on this graph. I mean, the fact that there is this infinitesimally small hole in the graph, the fact that this function isn't defined at two, isn't even showing up. So if you say, okay, this obviously isn't a very important discontinuity. We can't even see the thing. Let's just say that this function is defined at two. We're really not changing this graph in any serious way. If we look at its continuous extension, I mean, in fact, if I added the point, you see two undefined. If I added the point two, three, I'm just plugging up this tiny hole that wasn't even visible. So it's not really that big a deal to do this. Does anybody have any questions so far on this concept? Then let's, let's get some new terminology on the board. This terminology is in one sense pretty straightforward, in another sense it's pretty weak. Here some time is definition a function is continuous if it is continuous at every value where it is defined. And as I say, this definition is a little weird and can be a little unintuitive because if we're only looking at every value where the function is defined, then we're ignoring one of the reasons a function might not be continuous. We're only looking at values of C where F of C exists. And that can give us kind of weird situations. I mean, sort of weird when you say them out loud. F of X equals one divided by X is continuous. I'm later that today, I'm going to give you a list of continuous functions, but for now, let's just take my word that this is true. If you want the limit as X approaches C, of f of x 
you just take C and you plug it right in there. This is a true statement. Is this function continuous at zero? Shaking heads and you're right. It can't be continuous at zero because it's not defined at zero. So we have this kind of weird, definition where this is a continuous function with a discontinuity, which seems like something that shouldn't be allowed. But this is able to happen because when we define continuous function, we explicitly said we were only going to look at values where the function was defined. Sometimes, instead of just saying a function is continuous, We'll say that a function is continuous on its domain. This is the same as saying that a function is continuous, but it's reminding your reader or your listener or whatever that you're only looking at values of x where the function is defined. And if you use the phrase continuity on the domain of a function, this becomes, at least it seems to me, a lot less unintuitive. What we have now come on, there we go. What we have now is that this function is continuous on its domain and we have the note that x equals zero is not in the domain. So it can't be continuous at zero. As I say, continuity, continuity on the domain are formally the same definition. I just find that adding the on the domain bit kind of verifies things. A function is continuous on an interval if it's continuous at every value in the interval. Uh, to remind ourselves, an interval is something like this. One of the following four cases. And here, there is nothing about 
being continuous at every value in the interval where it's defined, it has to be continuous at every value in the interval. So again, this is a pretty, in a one sense, straightforward definition that ends up giving you some kind of weird sounding statements. So f of x equals one divided by x is continuous, but it's not continuous on the interval from negative one to one, because zero is in that interval and it is not continuous at zero. So you just have to kind of acclimatize to that, to the idea that we talk about functions being continuous, um, even when they're not continuous at certain points. Again, as long as the points aren't in the domain. Um, most day-to-day -day functions are continuous. That's, um, we'll, tomorrow we'll do some examples, but let me, Most day-to-day -day functions are continuous on their domains. So most limits are actually easy to take because, I mean, a statement about continuity is a statement that we can easily take the limit. If a function is continuous and we want its limit as x approaches c, we just have to plug c in there. That's in the definition of continuity. There's one type of function we've already explicitly said is, well, not explicitly because we didn't use the word, but there is one function or one type of function that we've already said was continuous, and that's the polynomial function. As I put on the board, some days back that if we have a polynomial and we want the limit as x approaches c of the polynomial, we can just take c and plug it in there. We now recognize that this equality is a statement about continuity. This, this statement is the statement that all polynomials are continuous. And actually, I don't want to rush through the list of continuous functions in four minutes. It's a long list. So let's call this lecture here and we'll finish this section tomorrow. Thank mm -hmm. you.